doing it. Um, and I think it's a useful time for us to start because we like this evening to be there as a record. I think it's quite a historical for, for me personally, I think for a lot of people who are here tonight, um, to be able to be part of this um, remembrance um, event. So just bear with me as I'm, I'm doing this. But it, would, it is also um, a reminder to everyone to actually speak into the mic so that the sound can be picked up as well. I'm going to go into the other. Um, so I'd like to welcome everyone today to SOAS and the South Asia Institute who's hosting this event, which is commemorating the life of Makhan Singh, who was, and we use the word radical, a radical trade unionist, an African nationalist. And in, for many of us, I'm, I personally have you know, part of my family who are from Kenya. But this isn't often a history that is told through our own family histories, our community histories. So it was a real pleasure through Amarjit Chandan and Shiraz Durrani, and then a chance meeting with Judith Hare a few months ago um, in the Netherlands, where you see that these histories actually are being remembered. Um, and as Shiraz has mentioned in his book that is being launched tonight here, and of course he's got a number of other books that are, are there as well, um, that this is, is a disappeared history, but it's one that is being recovered. So I think this is what we're trying to do this evening, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to um, hearing from the various speakers this evening. Um, I won't be talking too much here, so all I want to do is just to um, let you know who's speaking tonight. Um, we'll first have Shiraz Durrani, who's a Kenyan activist in exile, um, and who is also a retired senior lecturer from the London Metropolitan University. Um, who's also been very active and runs a publishing house, um, and of course has edited um, the book, A Revolutionary Tra Kenyan Trade Union is Makan Singh. Um, I've, I'll be sort of chairing, and my full name is Navdej Porewal, Dej, as I'm often known as, um, and I'm the deputy director here of the South Asia Institute. Um, uh, and our, so our first speaker will be Shiraz Rani. Our second speaker will be Arvinder Jabal, who is the grandson of Makan Singh. Um, so we have a number of different perspectives to be actually glean light on Makin Singh's life. So we've got family members and activists and academics who, um, people who've been involved in the left and the trade union movements either in this country or in Africa or in India. Our, our third speaker will be Mary Davis, who's a visiting professor in labor history at Royal Holloway University of London. Our fourth speaker uh, will be Judith Hare, Emeritus Fellow at Somerville College, University of Oxford. And then Sukant Chandan will also be joining us, who's an activist and filmmaker. So I'll begin now by inviting Shiraz Durrani to come and to introduce kind of the idea of the book and also to tell us a bit about the history of, of Makin Singh's life. I'm not giving you the full history of Makan Singh, his life and times and all the rest of it. I think you will need to read lots of books that have been written about him. What I'll do is I'll skim over some of the things, some of the events of his life, and particularly look at how what other people have said about him. I think it, this perhaps reflects uh, better what Makan Singh meant to people who, who worked with him. Um, so this is just very, very broad uh, uh, dates. So you know what we are talking about. Uh, he was born in India in 1913, uh, came to Kenya <coughs> in 1927, and worked in, a, in his father's printing press and actually it's working in the press is what gave him uh, the sort of experience of a life of a worker in Kenya. Um, for various reasons, he had to go back to, Ke to India, uh, where he again became very active in, in, the, in the politics of the Indian uh, liberation movement. And for that, the Indian, the British 
administration in India detained him for four and a half years or so. Uh, so, so he's be becoming a very dangerous person for the British Empire, as it were, from, from the establishment point of view. And they were trying to sort of do funny things to him, but he managed to return to Kenya in 1947, continued with his work with the trade union movement, with the working class, uh, for which he was again put in, in imprisoned for 11 years. Now, the question then is, what was this man up to? Wherever he went, he got ended up. He ended up in the, in British jails. Uh, a simple person who sort of uh, does nothing to the British Empire doesn't end up in jail. And I think, in a way, we need to go back uh, to 1920s and 30s to see the situation in 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 Kenya. But we we don't go too much back in there. But just to sort of remember that this was a period when. <coughs> the colonial administration was desperately keeping working class away from other people. It was desperately keeping the races away from each other. And here is this man who broke all those rules. And he posed such a great danger that the only way uh, they could silence him was in detention. So let's sort of see what's next. Uh, when we look at Martin Singh and what, what, what he was doing, I think it's good to keep that background in mind, that Kenya was, uh, has always seen a lot of anti-colonialist struggles. Mm -hmm. Even I'm just starting with the first track, uh, which was in 1900, of railway workers. But before that, every Kenyan nationality had resisted British colonialism in very many ways, and they are brutally suppressed. We, we don't have sort of a context of going back into those days, but I think when before 1900, people had been struggling. Uh, so there's some examples, and I, I've just taken this from Makin Singh's own books, which we'll look at a little later. So Makin Singh was not only an activist, <coughs> trade unionist, or organizer, he was also a historian. And if you want <coughs> to get the very good working class history of Kenya, uh, you will have to start with Makin Singh's books. Uh, so there was a history of uh, strikes, including various general strikes, and this in a sense shows the strength of the working class in Kenya. Uh, and various uh, organizations, because strikes and uh, workers' activities don't just happen in, in a vacuum. It requires organization, so there are various organizations happening, and I just given examples of two or three, and marketing himself was uh, active in forming others as well. <coughs> so in 1931, Mark Singh started working in a printing press, um, and as part of his trade union activity, uh, he was working with the Indian Trade Union uh, was elected uh, secretary and then president. For him, uh, the important thing was the unity of workers, not divide them up into races and work against each other in many ways. Uh, so he influenced the ITU, Indian Trade Union, uh, to change the ITU into Labor Trade Union of Kenya. And that was important because it was then open to all races. The British uh, colonial administration had sought very strongly to divide the people. So even political organizations had to be done by nationalities. The Kikuyu, the Luo, the Kamba, each of them had to have their own political organization. And here is the trade union movement opening its doors to <coughs> everybody. And an important sort of date in terms of the working class is the 1937 strike, uh, which was for 62 days. Mm -hmm. Now, even organizing even, uh, the strikes for even a few days is a difficult job. But the very fact that the union organized this and kept the workers going and strong uh, for 62 days until 
They won what they had set out to do, an eight-hour day, and the increase in, in wages. So that was a major uh, strength, major um, success for the trade union movement. And I think talking too much doesn't always do justice to the event. This is uh, demonstrations in 1937, <coughs> where the British colonialists would dismiss these workers as rubbish guys who, can't, who didn't know probably English and all the rest of it. But these are the people for organizing the strike. And interestingly, you see the image of a black policeman escorting them. This photo is again from Martin King's book. Stolen from that, I guess. <laughs> <coughs> now, this strike was an important uh, event because it, it, in a sense, brought the trade union movement into the forefront. First of all, his membership rose to 2,500 in Kenya and Uganda. Again, the colonial administrations had kept Kenya, Uganda, and later on Tanzania separate, Tanganyika. Uh, but the union <coughs> became strong in Uganda as well. And because of the strike and the strength, uh, the government had to accept the trade union movement in Kenya was to stay. They could not sort of marginalize it anymore. And the 1937 trade union ordinance made this possible, and the union was registered. By, the f by 1948, there were 16 trade unions affiliated to the Labour Trade Union of East Africa, mm -hmm. not Kenya anymore, East Africa, with a membership of 2,000 <coughs> workers. And some of this, this, uh, <coughs> this work of a trade union is interesting because they, an attempt was made <coughs> to bypass and to marginalize the union. We'll look at it in a minute, but when you look at the situation of trade unions in, in Britain today, the same tactics in a sense are being used to divide them up, to get one group fighting another, to bring legal restrictions on them. And this is the same thing in a sense happening in Kenya in those days. Now, this is a bit tricky, what's up here? Okay, I did it another format and this one is bypassed it. <coughs> uh, this was in 1939, he had to go to India uh, and, and he didn't go there for a holiday or to sort of uh, have a nice food there. And immediately he became active in the political working class struggle. In 1940 he addressed 30,000 Bombay workers who were on strike. Uh, and immersed in the freedom struggle and working class, the, the, the two aspects, freedom struggle, the struggle for liberation, political independence, and the working class movement. He immersed in both those, and for that he was arrested uh, in 1940, but they could not bring any charges, they just arrested him. But this man, I think like so often happens in prisons in the USA and even here, uh, he became stronger in prison. He strengthened his links with the communist, socialist, and other revolutionary leaders from all over India. In a sense, he consolidated and strengthened him. He gave him other ideas of, of how other people were struggling. He was released in 42, but restricted until 45. So in all, he was in detention or restriction for four and a half years in India. Having come out of restriction, he worked as a sub-editor of Jange Azadi, the weekly organ of CPI, Communist Party of India, until he left for Kenya in August 1947. And I think an important thing we, we sort of need to be aware of is <coughs> the communication aspect of it, of trade union work and political work. An important th point about him working in the press in, in Kenya was that he could organize leaf There were no sort of uh, Facebook and Twitter and all those kind of facilities in those days. So how do you go around talking to workers? An important tool was leaflets. We'll see some examples later. And working workers, whether working on the trains or taxi workers, would take these leaflets 
uh, into all the working class areas. They have this, they set up um, bicycles which would go into the residential areas and working class areas, ring the bells and announce uh, things about the forthcoming meetings and workers' struggles. So the communication aspect is without that, you cannot organize, you cannot bring forward your vision, as it were. In Kenya, again, <coughs> he started, but one of the things he was, he was, he was uh, talking to the South Asian communities, which again was divided by race, by class, by perspective, like it is even today. Um, and he, he said to us with the South Asian people to unite and work with Africans for democratic advance, establish democratic government with equal franchise and adult suffrage for everybody. So in those days it was kind of the white communities had the most power, the Asians the second, and the Africans almost nothing. And he fought against that, that attitude. And he <coughs> organized joint, uh, within Asian communities also, South Asian, uh, the Pakistani, the Indian, what is Pakistani later on, uh, he sought to bring them all together. And it's, he uh, sort of advised on setting up common high schools, learning Kiswali, the language, and learning culture and working with the African workers. So it was a kind of a very revolutionary message at that time. 47 to 50, he organized the Kenya Youth Conference, where he was elected the vice president, took part in East African Indian National Congress, um, organized East African Trade Union Congress, president of Fred Kubai. So he was already sort of working with uh, the African working class, uh, not isolated, working with the African liberation movement also. And in uh, 1950, he was the first person to call for complete independence for East Africa at a mass meeting of Kenya African Union and East African Indian National Congress. Now this was, I think, even the sort of African people, African organization with the fight for independence. Nobody had made that call. And he was the first person to do that. And that, that in a sense, is, is an important date, 1950. I just give this a quote from Akin Singhan. <coughs> Again, it shows his class consciousness about the awareness of the classes. This was the time when they were trying to make Nairobi a city and the other some royal guy from London was going to come and hand over some document to say, Nairobi, you are a city now. And what Akin Singh says is there are two Nairobis, that of the rich and that of the poor. The status of the latter has not changed. Celebration for the status of city will be justified on the day when this country's government becomes truly democratic with the workers fully sharing the tasks of government. And I think this is again another important point that he wasn't just talking about democracy in a broad sense of a parliament, uh, so-called elect members and so on. He's talking about workers sharing the tasks of government, which hasn't happened in this country even now. And this, this was uh, making that statement in those days, it's, it's, I think it's a revolutionary message which part of Kenyans need to go back to today. You know. Again, for all the things he was up to, the, he was arrested, made a speech where he said workers and the people of East Africa should further strengthen their unity, <coughs> become more resolute, uh, and speed up the movement for freedom of all workers and people of East Africa. Uh, that was too powerful a message. That the organization was too strong for the, for the colonial government. And on 15th May, <coughs> Makin Singh and Fred Kubai were arrested. And by that time, the working class was getting quite strong and organized. And there was a 10-day strike immediately when, after they were arrested. And the demand was release of arrested leaders and complete independence of East Africa. Now this became a call for the, of the workers and obviously increasing wages <coughs> as is part of the trade union work. Uh, 
I think Ravinder might talk a bit more about his uh, detention and so on. Uh, restricted in 1950, and it was, uh, again, the reasons were for his trade union activities, as general secretary of the East Africa Trade Union Congress, expression of political views in the course of national struggle for freedom and being a communist. These are sort of uh, what the colonization charged him with. So the restriction order came in 5th June, 1950, was restricted for 11 years. Uh, and that is m even more than what Kenyatta went through. Uh, and put together the, his four and a half years in India, it makes you wonder what was the significance of this person. One individual, very peaceful guy. If you see his picture, he's a very nice, quiet fellow. And yet, uh, he was restric restricted for 15 years or so. Again, in the restriction, he was, the pressure was brought on him to leave Kenya, go away somewhere else, even to India, to get rid of him, uh, or to change his attitude. Then he would be allowed to sort of go free. And even in that, because of the restriction time, it is cut off, cutting off from his family, from his political work, he, he refused to do any of those things, he refused to compromise. By 1950, after the Mauma movement was became 18 after 1948, <coughs> and it brought about changes. And that's, in a sense, led to one of the reasons for Market Singh's release in 1961, when it was clear that uh, colonialism had come to an end. In the period from 1960 to 63, was used by the British uh, colonial government and, and the British government itself to bring about changes and bring in laws and all the rest of it so that colonialism can live, so that imperialism can enter in a, in a way. Uh, so it was a kind of a changing of phase, phase really. Uh, Mackensen came out in 61 and resumed political and trade union activities, resumed membership of the printed and kindred trade union, union tra trade union, trade workers union. <coughs> He was elected to the Legislative Committee, he was elected Chair of Legislative Committee of Kenya Federation of Labor, and so on. 1962, he joined Kano, Kenya African National Union, and <coughs> he spent a lot of his time after that in writing the history of Kenya. Um, and he died in, on May 18, 1973. Uh, if <coughs> very briefly, what what was what was Martin Singh up to? What what did he, what did he want? He didn't want any money or wealth for himself. No, he didn't want any posts for himself. He was a very humble, gentle person, I think. But his vision was that uh, anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism, political independence with workers' rights and racial, economic, and political equality. Very, very simple, basic things. I think we would sort of, we would benefit in Britain also to, to, to go for the, some of those things. And the way he went about it was a strong organization, trade unions as a, as a political organization. That was important and necessary. And <coughs> his, we'll look at this in a minute, but linking economic and political struggles. What, what is the changes in law that were brought about before independence in Kenya was to say uh, these are the workers, these are the trade unions, your job is to fight for wages or hours of work and health and safety and those things. Don't get involved in politics. Leave politics <laughs> to organizations like Kano, which we can control and bribe and do things. And what Martin Singh always misunderstood was there is no such thing as workers' rights without their political rights as well. Mm. So he worked very closely with the political organizations. And in a sense, that has happened in Britain also today. I don't think the working class has any political power. It's just that recently there are some sort of positive signs happening, but it's a very, very recent development. That the lessons may be written as British uh, ruling classes learn from the colonial empire was to keep workers away from politics. 
If you combine the two, then you have to start detaining them and bringing in the army and so on. But that's not how things were. So he linked trade unions with liberation movement. He sought class and race unity. Communications, we mentioned a bit that it was important to have a strategy around how you're going to talk to people, how you politicize workers and others, so that otherwise you get the situation like in Britain today, where the mass media are owned by a few characters who are not interested in working class at all. Again, mass action, strikes, demonstration of politicization, those are important tools to, to bring the working class struggles to the forefront. Active, activism and sacrifice. I think there's one lesson that you learn from him is that he, was, he sacrificed a, a lot of things for his political and economic beliefs. There's some examples of some of the labor trade union of East Africa handbills, 1935 printed by Khalsa Press. <coughs> and well, I won't read this long thing, uh, but the important thing is that language issue. If you want to talk to people, talk to them in their language. Don't talk, talk to them in English when they don't know in English. So whether it's Punjabi, Gujarati, Urdu, whatever. The other languages are important. Some of the leaflets are in various languages. This is an example of what Mark said, his awareness and what he was talking about. Our worker comrades, the very language is, I think, alien to, well, to the empire, as it were. Come forward, march ahead. If you do not march ahead today, then remember that you will be crushed on the heels of capitalists tomorrow. Workers should have a united stand, which should stand up strongly and so on. Uh, and then some information about what's happening to one of those strikes at curse and leather and so that it brought in unity and people's awareness. Okay. I think I'll leave this. I'll leave this. Again a quote from him that the Kenyan State Union movement has always been a part of a national struggle for resistance to research link between trade union and politics. Some images of the middle one is his autobiography, which has now been published. The central one. Uh, again, in Gujarati, in Wakansan's spoke by Again, Fred Kubayo talks about linking economic and political struggles. We won't go into that. The centrality of trade union is one of the major epicenters of democracy. And the, the problem was colonialism and capitalism, which people had to fight for. Uh, Bildad Kagia, only Makan Singh had the spirit to fight I needed. Again, very uh, history in the sense of way has been interpreted at least. He divides up the trade union struggles from Mau Mau. And I think there's a very strong link if you look, if you look at some of the history of things and so on. So it wasn't that very Mau, uh, trade unions were going one direction, Mau Mau's and the very, <coughs> the strength of Mau Mau came from the trade union activists. So he provided the radical leadership, uh, which provided legally committed to overthrow colonialism, but it came from the trade union movement. And this is again interesting parallel with uh, South Africa. Um, from 91 to 96, the battle for ANC's soul was eventually lost to corporate power. We were entered by the neoliberal economy. We sold our people along the river. It wasn't in South Africa only, it happened in Kenya and in many other places as well. These are the two important history books of Mark Singh. Mark Singh archives in Nairobi, has a lot of stuff on it. Well, just references and some footnotes. Okay, so Arvinder, 
Jabal is Makan Singh's grandson will be um, giving us further insight into the life of Makan Singh. Thank you, Tej, uh, firstly for organizing this event. And uh, Shiraz, congratulations for finally getting your book done. Uh, you know, that's why we're here. <laughs> uh, just a brief intro introduction about myself. Uh, I'm uh, Hindpal, Makan Singh's eldest son's son. So I'm, I happen to be his oldest grandson, oldest grandchild as well. Uh, I was born in Kenya, grew up there and took O levels and A levels and everything over there. I did my levels in 1981. Uh, came to study in the UK and then I've been living here permanently since 88. So that's 27 odd years or something like that. Uh, I'll be, of course, much more briefer than uh, Shiraz. Uh, mine is more of a family aspect and things like that. Shiraz gave the history and all that. Uh, a few interesting things. Um, while I was growing up in Kenya, over there, um, especially in the primary education, now we we learned about the outside world, but they never really taught us about uh, the history of Kenya. By that I mean the the native people of Kenya. You know, you're talking about the Kikuyus and Luos and Maasai and all that. Interestingly, the president of the United States uh, happens to be of Luo origin, but I don't think they'll make them sort of teach anything about Luos in Kenya. You know, that's just a historical thing, really. Uh, so we learned nothing about the culture of the African people in, in school there. I don't think things have changed, well, although I haven't been there for a long time. Um, then he got uh, things like the independence of Kenya, which happened in 1963. But they never taught us about things that led up to independence of um, Kenya, or even the sort of East African countries like you know Tanzania and Uganda. Um, and who the people were involved and who sort of participated in the uh, nationalist struggles and all that. Now, if, if they had done that, then people would know more about Makan Singh and uh, other people. You got Pinto, Tom Boya, and so on and so forth. So this young generation in Kenya know nothing about those people of the 50s and 60s who fought for independence. It's just not there. All they teach about in uh, school over there is geography of the outside world, you know, South America or Australia, or history of Europe and whatnot. The, the last thing they teach about is history of Kenya itself. It's just something they're not interested in. Maybe it's modernization. I think today they be more interested in internet and stuff like that, you know. So let me start off uh, 1973. 1973 is when my grandfather died. I was uh, 10 or 11 in 1973. I remember him quite well. Uh, if you want to read this book, I've written some a few things about about that. Now, for the next 30 odd years, nothing much happened. Uh, on the odd occasion, you would have a phone call from local education, uh, sort of the local education authorities ringing the family to ask for his date of birth. The only thing of interest was he was, you know, he was deemed to be one of the founders of the trade union movement. And occasionally, I think there, there would be something minimal about that in, uh, in, the, in primary school education. Somebody called Makan Singh, who was one of the founders of the trade union movement. And probably the only question they'll ask, when was he born? And that's about it. Yeah. So fast forward to around about 2006, so we're skipping some, so we're going some 33 years since Makan Singh's death. Uh, there's a lady in Kenya called uh, Zarina Patel, she's of Indian origin, and uh, she herself is, uh, I think, a granddaughter of um, somebody called Jiwanji. Jiwanji, uh, yeah. So anybody who's been to Kenya might know Jiwanji Gardens. It's right in front of uh, Nairobi University. It's still. I think it still exists to the present day. She happens to be his granddaughter. Uh, she's also a writer and a sort of a activist. So she decided to write a book about Makan Singh. 
around about 2005, 2006, and that book is Unquiet, it's called Unquiet. It's quite a comprehensive uh, book about uh, Makhan Singh. After that, a few years later, somebody by the name of Atamjit Singh, he happens to be a, a Punjabi playwright, he happened to be in Kenya and uh, met, met some people and asked, inquired if there were any well-known Punjabi people in Kenya who did something for the country and somebody mentioned this book uh, written by Zarina Patel. Uh, now, so that, so Atamji decided to, to, to write a play in Punjabi, uh, finally called Mungu Comrade. So anybody who's sort of born in uh, Kenya would know Mungu means God. I think uh, at, at some stage uh, during during the period when there's a discussion on the naming of that play, so there's some objection on the name why you know on, on Mungu. But anyway, um, the play was known as Mungu Comrade. He he Atamjit um, he's he's given a lot of um, um, what do you call uh, readings on his play? Uh, one took place in 2008 in London and on Nottingham. I, I hosted the one in uh, London. I think the only one in this congreg congregation was uh, um, Mr. Amarjit Chandan sitting in front of me. I think he's the only one who, who was there. Last year in 2014, there was a, a fairly major reading of his play in Nairobi. And uh, with the greatest respect to Atamjit, uh, you would normally expect a play to develop, uh, sort of a reading to develop into an actual full-blown play. But that's not actually happened in, in, uh, in, in the case of Makan Singh. And I've got my own reason, which I'm going to give shortly with due respect to Atamjit. Now, I think the reason people go see plays or movies or anything is partly um, entertainment. You know, the other you can always spend Sunday doing something else, like watching football. You know, uh, why would somebody go see a play about a historical character unless you got really interested in him? Um, I think the character of the indiv individual comes in. Um, in other words, was he a colourful character or not? Now, the other Sikhs from Punjab who uh, have achieved a lot in their own fields. Uh, I'll give one example, Milka Singh. Uh, he's a fairly well-known uh, athlete. Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard of him. Uh, but he's quite a colorful character. And recently, uh, there's a film, a uh, Bollywood film about Milka Singh called uh, Bug, Mi Bug Milka or something like that. Yeah, some of these people here have seen. Um, so, you know, you got other characters like uh, Bishan Bedi, you know, he's a well known uh, cricketer, quite a colorful character. So, that's the reason people want to, you know, go and see a play or a movie, you know, they want to be entertained. Now, you could not find a less colorful character than Makan Singh. Now I'm saying as his grandfather, uh, grandson, uh, anybody who knew him personally uh, would probably agree with that. I think in, over here the only people who knew him personally or met him personally is Amit. I, I just recognize a gentleman there, uh, Chamal Lal Chamal. Of course knew my grandfather very, very well. Sorry, nice to see you after several years. Uh, I think he interviewed my grandfather when he's released from uh, you know, detention and all, all that. Chamal uh, Chamal is a well-known uh, sort of TV person. Um, in private, he was, he was uh, rather aloof and he sort of somebody who kept to himself. He, he never discussed his own past. Uh, that's the last thing he would do. In fact, he would discuss very little, to be honest. He just won't have any interest in saying what happened in his life. Today, people are obviously discussing him. So um, now, so you know, we come back to Shiraz's book today, 2015. It's a culmin I think it's a culmination of all these things. So if you, if you look, 
if you look sort of historically, for more than 30 years, from 73 to about 2006, you know, nothing much happened. Then, then from around 2006 to now, 10 year period, there's been a lot of interest about Makhan Singh culminating in uh, Shiraz's book today. I, I think uh, history and historical characters can be cyclical in the sense that people lose interest, and then after a certain period, people gain interest. Now, it's possible, it's possible. It could be another th 30 years of nothing much happening. And then 10 more years of new Zarinas, new Atamjits, new Shiraz Duranis into the picture. I must mention uh, a gentleman sitting here, Amarjit Chandan, who's contributed uh, hugely to all these books and plays we were sort of mentioning. Uh, even uh, he's all contributed a lot to Shiraz Duranis' book, and uh, you know, you must, you must mention him in this. Um, so, so I'm now coming to the end. It's something quite interesting about him. Uh, he, I think, he married young. In those days, he married people married. He was about 20 years old. 20 years old when he got married. His wife Satwant was 16 because she told me that. So obviously that's true. So, uh, so one of the things when he got married, he was asked to uh, to recite something, you know, like uh, by. The, by the bride sisters or cousins or something and he said something very interesting which I first read in Zarina's book sort of mentioned here in this book it was something along these lines uh, he said those who lead the path of righteousness are the ones remembered in this world now that is the reason we are here today uh, that is why 40 years down the road people have something to say about him because he did something right. Uh, that's very interesting. Finally, um, he left behind a, a huge amount of paperwork, his handwritten archive, some 20,000 or something. These are at currently in Nairobi University. They've all been archived in PDF, uh, but not in any specific order at the moment. Uh, I was discussing with Amarji Tandon just today. Despite that, uh, I don't think, unless uh, Mr. Chamalal there corrects me, I don't think there exists any tapes about him, uh, either of his speaking or uh, any sort of anything on video, anything. But it's something somebody might have to sort of look into, go into probably the Voice of Kenya archives. But so, you know, you. And I was telling uh, Amarjit, look, uh, there's always something left behind. You can't, you, he, history doesn't record everything of a person. There's always something left behind. So it's possible he may have left 20,000 papers, but there's not a single sound recording of him or uh, anything you could see on a screen. So I end there and congratulate Shiraz for his work. Thank you, Shiraz. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, um, my apology uh, for coming late. And uh, at my age, people do get late. Um, I, I have some memories to uh, share with you because uh, uh, two things. Uh, when uh, Makhan Singh was released, I was uh, at your place, you know, in Park Road. And uh, President Kenyatta, at that time he was the Prime Minister, and uh, uh, Eching Oneko also came, and uh, Oginga Odinga. They all came to uh, his residence to receive him. I was there to cover that event, and uh, we were very, very pleased to see him. And then, 
later on, uh, Makhan Singh and I shared the same desk where he used to translate news from English to Hindustani. And uh, however, as I have told uh, Amarjeet, there's no recording because Makhan Singh never read news. He only translated them. Uh, my memories, he, he spoke very little. He was very reserved person. And once I remarked, I asked him uh, in, in uh, Punjabi, I said, you know, I said, you should be at least the permanent secretary to President Kenyatta because you have done so much. He kept quiet. And uh, that silence, in fact, uh, said a lot volumes because Makhan Singh, uh, as I could understand, he never compromised his principles. Otherwise, he could have been something big. And everything changed in, in Kenya. Kinata was not the same person when he was imprisoned, when he came out. And there may be many reasons. Uh, if you please allow me to say, uh, he was spoiled uh, by uh, imperialists and he was given all the comforts and uh, that's how it happened. But I have a uh, lot of respect for Makhan Singh. I wish he could have been on there, he could have read the news, I could have been the first person to get his uh, voice. And uh, talking about archives in uh, Kenya, in Voice of Kenya, you know, didn't leave anything as far as Asian service was concerned. Because I especially went to Kenya to find out if there are any recordings left. Um, and uh, I went to the library and I was given access because I knew each and every record over there. And I was uh, shocked to find no, none of the tapes were there. And I asked them, what happened to so many tapes? You know, they were in archives. They said, you know, they, were, they ran short of the tapes and they cleaned them and they used them again. So it's, uh, and we were not Asians, I'm sorry. I am one of them. We were not very careful to uh, look after our things. And Makhan Singh happened to be one of them. Um, I wish. There were so many uh, things, and I'm, I'm pleased to know that uh, a library, you know, Narubi Library has something, and uh, Amarjit should do something to put them in order. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm so pleased uh, to come and share my little memories with you. Thank you very much. Next, we have Mary Davis, who's going to be. Um, to add, would you like to speak from from where you're sitting, or the mic yeah, should? Um, <laughs> I hope you're. Ooh, can you hear me? Um, I hope you'll excuse me not standing up. Only I've broken my back and fractured my pelvis, but apart from that, I'm fine. Don't feel <laughs> sorry for me. And you know, look how I struggle for the cause. Macklin Singh obviously struggled for 15 years in prison for trade unionism, so actually, I'm all right. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm taking a slightly different view, um, n not a negative view at all. I think there's many people here who know more about Makan Singh than I do, so I am going to say how I got to know about him, and, um, and basically it was through my research on the TUC and on Labour Party colonial policy, which len le led me to Makan Singh. Um, and I think that's the context that I want to look at, it, uh, look at him in, because I've also looked at, of course, MI5 files. <laughs> I have gone through them with a fine to tooth comb. And Makan Singh is very prominent, I can tell you. Well, you know that, don't you? I won't go through all that. 
But also, I've got to be... I'm going to have to make an admission. The fact that I share Makan Singh's politics led me to him. Um, and I fa the fact that um, his politics are insufficiently mentioned except by the colonial authorities who hated him because he was a communist. And, uh, and they regarded communists as the most dangerous people in the world. And so, by the way, did the TUC and so did the Labour Party, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, so let me just um, say something about the TUC and the Labour Party. I'm talking about the Labour Party in the early years and the TUC in the early years. In the 1920s, um, the TUC, Trade Union Congress, um, they had a colonial policy and it was motivated by two fears. One was national liberation struggles. They did not want the colonial world to become free of the British Empire. They were utter imperialists through and through. And secondly, they were scared of a new force that had arisen in Soviet Russia, the Comintern. Now, the, Com the Comintern, the Communist International, was a new force for, for them. And they had to um, get their heads around it. Um, in, the Comintern had established a communist university of the toilers of the East. Now, what did that mean? It didn't actually mean people who lived, well, they did mean, it did mean people who lived in the East. It was people like um, John Kamyata, Makan Singh. Um, if you think of all the people who led liberation struggles, they were invited to Moscow and trained. And the TUC really, and, and of course MI5 and MI6, hated these people. They regarded them as uh, real problems. Now the Labour Party took up this line. In 1924, the Labour Party established its own, own Imperial Advisory Committee. And the TUC, um, in 1937, established a Colonial um, Advisory Committee. And what this body did, quite amazingly actually, um, was to s recruit what they called labor advisors and sent them to the colonies to assist in the development of trade unions on the British model. Now that was the key thing. It had to be on the British model because if it wasn't, these would be very dangerous organizations and they would foment trouble and yeah, what would they be? Yeah. So, in um, from 1940 to 51, Labour was in. They were they were they weren't in power for all that time, but they were part of the, the coalition government. And then from 45 to 51, they were the first, it was the first majority Labour government, and. Um, Labour established, well, in 1940, actually, the Colonial Development and Welfare Act. It sounds wonderful, but it wasn't. Um, it was very, very opportunist. Um, and what they did, um, uh, it's, well, there's, there was a number of things, really. Uh, first of all, um, in um, th there was this colonial um, development and welfare act was passed because it was uh, motivated by fear that grievance and grievances among colonial peoples would be exploited in inverted commas by communists, and therefore, whilst not motivated by anti-imperialist sentiment, Labour policy recognised that reform was necessary. And one of the key features of the reform programme was to permit, in inverted commas, 
the development of non-militant trade unions. Makan Singh did not fit into this category at all. So, the, um, it, it was clear um, that, um, uh, oh, well, there's, there's very other examples of this, by the way, I should say. Um, it, um, <laughs> the TUC, or the government, I should say, um, developed trade union education for the colonies, for uh, colonial peoples. And the question was, where should trade union education be carried out? Should it be carried out in the colonies? Or should colonial peoples be brought to this country, possibly to Ruskin, and educated there? Well, this, was, this took a long time to resolve. They decided in the end that it was better to train um, colonial trade unionists in their own country, not bring them to Britain, because what might happen is that they might experience, well, you can probably, <laughs> they might experience racism. And if they experience racism, which they inevitably would have done, that would put them off Britain forever. And that, well, that wouldn't be very good. So, but it didn't completely resolve the issue because if, um, if they were going to be educated in their own countries, what kind of education was it going to be? <laughs> so there was a heavily doctored trade union syllabus that was taught in the colonies. And in particular, anybody who knows about British um, trade, trade union history will know that the early period, especially the period 1780 to 1850, was very radical. Uh, I mean, I've taught this m m for many years myself. So they, they cut that out completely. They didn't want to give these colonial trade unionists any inkling that um, British trade unions had been very radical. I mean, after all, if you think about chartism, if you think about the um, early trade unionism, which was very radical. Um, so stop all that, which they do. Now, um, in 1949, the TUC disaffiliated from the World Federation of Trade Unions, which was um, uh, had a uh, largely had, well, had had the whole world in it including um, the Soviet Union, including the, the um, Eastern European countries. Um, so basically, um, that was a very significant move for the, for the British Trade Union movement to do that. And they joined instead the International Confederation of Free Trade Unions, which was dominated by the Americans. And, uh, that showed the direction of the British TUC. What happened uh, was um, that uh, legalising trade unions in the colonies was an important next step. And this was introduced to ensure that um, basically um, Authorised trade unions were formed, especially in Asia and Africa, because the TUC was fearful of the alternative. And um, the and this is, by the way, where the East African trade unions uh, came here. Um, all these unions, which were so-called legalised. There, there was compulsory uh, registration um, of them. Uh, th the reason being they wanted to root out troublemakers, and in particular in Kenya. Um, Makansin was a very good example. He was the 
public enemy number one as far as the TUC and the Labour Party were concerned. And that's why um, in 1950, Makan Singh and Fred Kubai um, of the East African Trade Union Confederation were arrested. And this led to um, trade union advisors running rampant uh, by 1954 in 15 colonies. Now, let me give you a, a flavour of what these, uh, of, what, of what they did. I think this is a classic. Um, the Kenya Guide to what is a trade union said the following. <laughs> we read this with a lot of them. Um, but but it, it's very serious, actually. It's not a joke. Um, it said, trade unions are formed so that strikes can be avoided. Trade unions try to make sure that workers and employers understand one another. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, the value of a worker to his employer depends on the kind of work he does. Good, hard work is of more value than bad, lazy work. <laughs> I mean, this was seriously produced. I mean, there are worse examples. Um, in Malaya, um, for example, um, the trade union guide, um, and it was, again, to set up tame trade unions free of communist influence. Um, but the Malayan Federation had already set up, and it did have communist influence. And um, the, uh, the, the, Colum the Labour advisor in Malaya, a man called Brazier, um, said that it was um, the government a directive issued to Brazier instructed him to keep government constantly informed of all developments within the trade union movement, to bring immediately to the notice of the government any activities which are considered prejudicial to the development of sound trade union, unionism, to inform the government of any behaviour on behalf of members or officials of trade unions which may give rise to to suspicion that their activities may be prejudicial to the government or the welfare of the country. So I'm not going to go on and on. I could quote from so many of these awful things. Um, hmm? I, I'm quoting from a chapter I've written in a book which is called The British Labour Movement and Imperialism. Um, and it's uh, available. <laughs> it probably isn't available anymore. Um, anyway, the, the, po the point I'm making, of course, is that the government, the Labour Party and the TUC all saw trade unions as key to the development of their neo-colonial strategy. And that meant that people like Makan Singh were enemies, enemies of the state, Enemies of their own trade unions, as far as they were concerned, they were not seen as trade unionists. The, the, um, what they wanted to do was to, if they couldn't destroy, um, if they couldn't destroy uh, anti-imperialism, then they had to ensure that it was tame anti-imperialism, i.e. neo-colonialism, and that it was safe then for the British government, if, even if it lost its empire, to ensure that um, all its produce and all its, and its economy could still be um, dominated uh, within the colonies. There was no real colonial independence at all, as I'm sure you know, and Makan Singh knew that. So I wanted just to present that context really um, because I think it's important um, so that we I'm sure you you understand that but I I've read Shiraz's book I've read that book by that but, yeah, yeah. Um, and 
there are people here I know in this room who know an awful lot more about Mahanting than I do. But anyway, so that's my offering. Well, next we have Judith Hare who's going to be speaking. You're welcome to talk from there. Or? Thank you. Yes, thank you. I have a, um, I come into this from a very different position. But I didn't know Muck and Singh, and in a sense, um, my big question is why I didn't know Muck and Singh. Um, I came into the Kenya story as a PhD student in, the, um, in 1962, when the British was just about to release it to, to um, back out. And so I was there for the um, turnover from the British to the the new Kenyan state, and the years after that, um, when the really important battle in the new Kenya took place between the left and the right. Um, I'm an economist. Um, I did a PhD on Kenyan um, African agriculture and went on to be involved in the um, economics department, originally the Institute for Development Studies, and then the economics department in the University of Nairobi, and was there until 1975 when I finally left. So I lived through the period from 1962 to 1975 in Kenya as part of um, a group of people who were working very actively behind the scenes to support the left um, politicians, the left movement that was um, fighting really very actively and very successfully in the period of the very early 1960s and then gradually got um, decimated and eventually completely defeated by the end of the, 90s, uh, of the 1960s and the beginning of the 1970s. Um, one of the people that my husband and I worked most closely with um, was Pio Gama Pinto, um, but there were also the Fred Kubais and Bildad Kagia and a number of other um, people who were forming this um, group that was trying to restrain, trying to fight, trying to oppose what was going on on the other side of the um, nationalist movement. Um, it was a period, I'm just wanting to pick up a little bit on this, um, this thing about communism. Um, the, the, communist, the, the communist label, the, the sort of bogeyism with which people managed to label communism and the way in which people treated communism in those days was quite incredible. Um, I had been active in the Labour Party, left the Labour Party uh, when I was a student in the late 1950s in Britain. And I'd been um, very much part of, I'd been taken in by this whole thing that communism was beyond the pale. I mean, you could be radical, you could be left, but you certainly couldn't be a communist. It would be a death, a political death to be a communist. And going into Kenya, it was even worse because you couldn't have any communist literature. You had to take anything that was any Marxist literature in with a paper cover because if people discovered it in your, in your baggage, then it would be confiscated and you would be in trouble. So there was no question for us that it was not something we could do, which was to identify ourselves as communists or be communists. Mm. And um, the people in the group that I was working with in the, on the political front were not, um, not using the label communist, not saying that they were communist, but saying they were socialist and saying they were asking for justice for the people who fought for freedom and focusing a lot on land. The other thing about the period when I was there was that um, I was working in the university, my husband was a civil servant, and it was, um, we were leading double lives. It was not possible in those days to be both a um, member of a university, university faculty and a civil servant and be known to be associated with this struggle on the left. So we were um, meeting all these people um, on the political issues, 
writing briefs, discussing strategy, trying to push the political agenda um, as undercover, in an undercover way. So we had our um, um, respectable positions as civil servants, university lecturers, and then we had our underground existence trying to um, support this um, freedom, well, this, this left-right um, struggle. Now, what's um, very interesting to me coming um, into this discussion about Mackensen is that Mackensen was, for me, a, a nebulous figure in the background who I knew of as, as a legacy, uh, as somebody who had been extremely important in the 1930s and 40s, who had made a huge contribution and had framed a lot of what was going on at that period, and then somehow disappeared from the scene. I actually thought that he was in exile. I didn't realize that he was in Nairobi at that time. He certainly wasn't part of any of the, um, the groups that we were part of that I would have thought, given his history, I would have expected him to have been. Um, so he'd, he'd sort of dropped out in a political sense. Um, he, was, he was absent. Now, what I think of um, when I look at having read Zarina Patel's book, which I think is an extremely valuable resource, but it's more like an archive for me than, mm -hmm. than an analysis, and it's a very good, very detailed account of the papers that one can see there. <laughs> Um, but it's quite tough going, quite difficult to read. And then reading this book, which I think is a very refreshing and, and, and really successful um, book that um, Shiraz has just um, edited and many of you have contributed to. Um, what, it, what it brings home to me is something which has been something I've been worrying about for some time, which is that in the historiography of Kenya, and the writings on Kenya amongst academics, as well as um, in the popular imagination, in the school syllabuses, in the um, media in Kenya, there is so little space for anyone who is non-African. So the Asians in the Kenya story are so um, marginalized, are so um, pushed onto the edges, are not taken seriously, are not given anything like their due um, recognition, their due weight. And Makan Singh, in a way, is the most serious example of all, I think, because it's so clear that Makan Singh, in the 1930s, his role in the trade unions, but in the 1940s, his role in the independence movement, the beginnings of the independence movement, was so critical. Um, I mean, it was, it was not that he was a minor player, it was not that he was a bit player. He was a major figure, and he was a major figure working on an equal footing with the other major figures that have given so much recognition these days and are thought of as being the, the big heroes of the Kenyan national struggle and the big heroes of the, nation, of the Kenyan independence movement. Um, so one of the things I think that um, we need to recognize and hopefully one day will get um, rectified is the fact that um, it's not only Makan Singh, but there are a number of other Kenyan Asians like Pio Gamapinto, like Pranav Chef, um, even like Atru Kapila, a number of other people who were quite significant figures in the independence story and in the um, history of, of Kenya at that time about whom we know very little, we hear very little, and whose stories have not been told, but also whose, whose role in the wider picture has not been given sufficient weight. So I think it's very difficult to understand what happened in the um, <coughs> late 1940s, early 50s, in the emergence of the Mau Mau um, movement and the Mau Mau struggle without giving sufficient recognition to people like Mackin Singh. I mean, it doesn't really, it's very difficult to make sense of how that all happened. I mean, let alone the role of Kenyatta, who was not a significant mover in that. But I think that the fact we aren't able so far to get serious historians of Kenya to look at the role of the non-Africans in this um, story is, is a very serious um, problem. Um, having said that, um, I want to say I, I think what's, what's terrific about this book is that it's, um, 
it brings out so many really important things about um, Malcolm Singh. But um, there was the thing about the, the fact that he insisted on calling himself a communist and insisted on asserting that he was a communist right through the period when it became increasingly dangerous to do so, increasingly unpopular to do so, and that he clearly wasn't compromising on that as on a number of other things. And of course, the other thing that's been mentioned that was so important about Malcolm Singh was his completely non-racial attitude. He's, the fact he managed to be so um, affected by the racism and the, um, the fact that the Asian community itself was so um, in such a difficult position because it was treated, the divide and rule policy gave so many Asians a somewhat better position than Africans because they were Asian. So it, was, it must have been very difficult for him to stick to that line in the 1930s and the 1940s of being absolutely clear that Asians and Africans were treated as equals and were on an equal footing in the trade union movement and that there was no other way that it could be. That was extremely unusual at that period and in the Kenya setting where the divide and rule policy was so successful and so much of the Asian community was taken in by it and was um, overtly not very friendly to the African cause. Um, the things that, uh, oh, the, the, the big um, question then that I would like to raise is, um, what's a complete puzzle to me from the bits and pieces that I've been reading from, the, from um, this book and from Zarina Patel's account and the other few little things that I know. I don't think we have um, any answer to the question of why when Mukhan Singh came out of detention in 1961, or was it 1960, um, he just disappeared in the political sense, on the political scene. It, it doesn't seem to me to be enough to, to say that he didn't want to push himself forward, he was a very modest person, he was not the kind of person to push his own um, cause, because in the 1930s and 40s, when he was so successful, he had been working against horrendous odds. And he was a very effective operator, a very effective um, activist, agent. Um, he knew how to engage politically in an effective way. So it's a big question mark for me why he was unable to do this or didn't do this when he was released in the early 60s. I think, however, that what was um, very clear, and what you have just told us has been very interesting and all that, is that the trade union movement by the early 60s was a completely different kettle of fish mm -hmm. from what it had been in the 1940s. We've had that period when they gave the Mama um, detentions to the movement of the Kikuyus on the political scene. It wasn't just what was happening in the forests and in the uh, rural areas. But Nairobi had been completely cleared of the Kikuyus, and the, they were they were out of the trade union movement, mm -hmm. and they were out of the scene, they were out of the urban workers' scene, and um, the trade unions were also, if you might say, cleansed and very effectively um, changed in the sort of image that you are mm -hmm. giving us. But mm -hmm. I think of it as being American as much as British, because mm -hmm. there was the Boya mm -hmm. and the. Um, International Federation and so on, which, which were very strongly part of what happened to the trade unions in the 1950s. So um, when Martin Singh comes out of, of detention in the early 60s, it's, I can see that it's not at all easy to imagine him slotting back into an effective position in the trade unions. It's also true that a lot of the um, active political debate at that time was, was focused on land, and the rural questions and the land grabbing that was going on and the, the whole um, question of whether the people who fought the Mama's trouble were or were not being executed in the independent settlement. There's something else very curious to me in the, in the book, which, is, which comes out in the book, which um, is this, there are a couple of statements in there about the fact that he, he came back to Kenya in 1947 reasonably happily because India by then had got its independence. Mm -hmm. He came out of detention in the early 60s, speaking very strongly in favor of people getting behind Jomo Kenyatta, because he saw that as being, we've achieved the independence struggle for which we've been working in Kenya, 
and he's obviously the person we have to work with. And I wonder if one of the things that was happening also that he was not um, able to see quickly enough the way in which that um, post-independence um, division developed between the people who were trying to hold on to the fruits of independence by stepping into the shoes of the British on the one hand, and the people who thought that it was important to fight for the rights of the impoverished and the poor on the other. Um, but it's a big question for me. I mean, why was Smucker Sings Hill not, not part of all of our scene? Why wasn't he um, more present in the 1960s in a political sense than he had been in the early period? And I have to say that I, I really appreciate this book. I really appreciate what all of you are doing to bring out his earlier history, because that's where obviously his big contribution was, is what he did in his, don't forget, in his 20s and 30s. I mean, you know, the, the periods when he was active and so influential and did such a lot, he was incredibly young. He was detained more to his 40s. By the time he comes out, he's only 50. What do you say? And I don't think this is, I'm just giving you my very personal impression, but um, I think these raise very um, big questions. You need lots more research. Okay, so our next speaker is Sukhan Chandan, who is a filmmaker and social activist, as well as the son of Amarjit Chandan and the grandson of Gopal Singh, who was a close comrade of Lakhan Singh. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Shiraz Durrani, obviously, for publishing this book and your accomplishment. And uh, in relation to you, and um, I hope you don't mind, I'd like to dedicate this uh, just modest contribution to Jamit Durrani, um, because I know if uh, Jamit was with us today, he would be in the room with us and he'd be celebrating your uh, fantastic work. So, so thank you to Jamit as well, because I remember back in university with Jamit, he, um, which is Shiraz's son, he took uh, the name Deedon, DJ Deedon, because he used to DJ the records, as you know. And uh, he used to celebrate the revolutionary history of East Africa. And obviously, it was through the drip drip education from his father, i.e., you, that he learned those things. And similarly, it's through being the son of my father that I have learned about Gopal Singh Chandan as well, who was comrades with Makan Singh. So it's funny how these different uh, uh, Gopal Singh Chandan is the, uh, the uh, bottom left, if I'm not mistaken, of the picture. And um, so Jamit had been given the, the task, as it were, as I've been given, whether our fathers like it or not, to uh, continue that legacy. For all that it's worth, the good and the bad of trying to continue that legacy uh, in the heart of whiteness uh, where we are today in, in, in London. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a formidable task, perhaps a foolish task, to try and continue that struggle in the, the current circumstances we have. So I wanted to just very briefly outline four points in relation to what I've learned from my father and from you, Shiraz, um, about Makan Singh. Um, first point is about unity, unity between South Asians, between the people of the Indian subcontinent, undivided India. Second is unity again between the people of uh, what was used to be called the Third World, or now is called the Global South, but particularly focusing on unity between African and Asian people. And thirdly, I wanted to talk about the continuation of imperialism, 
and colonialism and neo-colonialism, because guess what, it hasn't gone away. It's very much still here and, and, and creating havoc and destruction and problems ongoingly. And fourth, I wanted to talk about the, the importance of uh, protecting these histories, our stories um, of revolutionary struggle and liberation struggle and, and, and inculcating, popularizing, propagandizing and protecting all of that for, for, for newer generations. First of all, on the issue of unity. Now, the, the, the British colonial system hasn't changed its spots. It continues with a divide and rule uh, uh, strategy today, which is devastatingly successful. Actually, that divide and rule strategy is more successful today than it was in the time of Makan Singh and Gopal Singh. Uh, multiculturalism, although it's perhaps rightly partially celebrated as a great thing, is none other than the continuation of the typical British colonial approach to the quote-unquote colonial people. Celebrate a little bit of samosa and steel pans, you know, uh, kind of uh, principalize their caste, religious, ethnic, linguistic, nationalist divisions. Celebrate that and say that's unity and you've all arrived, mm -hmm. right? Makan Singh and Gopal Singh and the, and the revolutionaries in Nairobi of their time did not agree with that. And they st st stuck their necks out. So I put it to the younger generations of my generation and younger. If these revolutionaries could do it then, with all that was railed against them, why can't we do the same today? We're not going to face jail. We're not going to face worse for, for advocating unity amongst the people of undivided India. So why don't we take inspiration and model for them? If I'm not mistaken, Makan Singh went on a hunger strike to oppose the sectarianism within uh, the uh, Muslim and Sikh organizations in Nairobi and Kenya. He went on a hunger strike to oppose the sectional uh, electoral, uh, the, 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 the sectionizing of electoral politics in Kenya. He says, no, we must fight against that. And also, you can, in the trade union work, I'll come to the African Asian unity in a second, but you can see that Makan Singh was brilliant in advocating and achieving the unity between Gujaratis, between Punjabis, between uh, people in the north of India, then what became Pakistan. Even when Pakistan was formed, he advocated unity with the people of Pakistan in Kenya against British colonialism. How beautiful and inspiring is that? And what a lesson for us Punjabis and Gujaratis and Bengalis and people of Pakistan, the Balochis, Sindhis, Patans, Punjabis, etc., to learn from and to inform our challenges today. He also, uh, and uh, you know, it was interesting to hear uh, that the, a play, which will be turned into an actual play or a film even, may not be uh, interesting and exciting. I'm not trying to compare the two men. They're, they're different in their own regards and have, they have different degrees of achievements and what they were doing. But if films can be made about uh, Shahid Bhagat Singh, who lived a very short life, I think probably a dozen films or something have been made, at least five, six, seven films have been made about Shahid Bhagat Singh, which, which some of us called Azam, the greatest martyr of our anti-colonial cause. Someone like Makan Singh, I understand he was a very modest and humble man, but someone who did all that he did, perhaps it's just my politics that informs you this, but it's incredibly exciting and fascinating and it would be wonderful to see that play being performed and films about this hidden uh, aspect of the liberation struggle. Also, Makan Singh also, um, with, with, with my paternal grandfather, also helped to funnel in the underground Ghadar Party revolutionaries to Moscow. That's very exciting to me, an incredible thing that they, that they achieved as well. And then I come now to the the, the, the unity aspect of African and Asian people. Because just like the divisions which the British colonialists sow amongst us, people of South Asia today, they are sowing divisions between African and Asian people all the time. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you, I can't count on both hands, innumerable times that I've been told, you have no right to speak about Africa, by some, not all, you have no right to speak about this or that, and this essentialization of divisions amongst oppressed peoples. Whether speakers, speakers before have referenced it, we must fight against the divide and rule. We must 
uh, uh, recognize and expose and defeat the hierarchy that's imposed upon us by uh, the ruling circles of the continuing British colonialists and imperialists today, while recognize that we must fight for unity. Because look what Mukhan Singh achieved. It was Mukhan Singh who contributed greatly to radicalizing the cause of general, not only Kenyan national liberation, but East African liberation as well. Because wasn't it Mukhan Singh who, who developed the Kenyan uh, labor union into the East African labor union? Yeah, exactly. You know, and that's, that's a wonderful thing of regional unity that a someone from Punjab had helped to achieve in Kenya. That's surely something for all people of the African continent, all people across the world to celebrate. What a wonderful, beautiful thing that is. Now, I, I was reading Franz Fanon's uh, wonderful book, Towards the African Revolution, recently. And in, 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 in that book, he says something quite interesting. He's written, he, I think that book was written in, in, the, in the late 50s. Who, who, who Franz Fanon. Oh, Franz Fanon. Yeah. And, and, and he, said, he said, China, he was referencing China and India, obviously, and also Dien Bien Phu. He's, and he said, somewhat a little exaggeratedly, but it's, understand, it's understandable in the context of the time. He said, Asia has freed itself from colonialism. Now Africa must do the same. And, and the African revolutionaries were particularly inspired, particularly those that, who were under the jackboot of the French colonialists by Dien Bien Phu, because it was the defeat of the French colonialists in Vietnam. And then he says, that, and, and that inspired the Algerians and the Senegalese and the other people uh, uh, under the French jackboot in, jack in Africa. But here was Mukhan Singh who personified that growing strategy of liberation struggle. That once India became free in 1947, this great man went back to Kenya and to fight for Kenyan liberation. What an amazing man. What an amazing example to us all that, that, that achieved, I've contributed and achieved at least formal independence in India, I must go back now to Kenya and to, and, and, and to work with the revolutionaries there to develop that. And the man raised for the first time the slogan, uh, Uhuru Sasa, independence now, which has been referenced before, I think by Shiraz as well. And then again, it's with great pride that I remember the Mau Mau, the Land and Freedom Liberation Party, also known as, and that my own uh, paternal grandfather took one of the very, very few pictures of Dean Kamathi who has seen, like Che Guevara and like Fanon and Malcolm X, uh, many people know about Dedan Kimathi, but they don't really know him. They know the face, they know the badge, they know the flag, but they don't know actually who the Mau Mau and Dedan Kimathi and his comrades were. But here was Punjabis working with these Kenyan Kikuyu revolutionary figures, the people who just inspired fear and terror in the hearts of the British colonialists. And that's another wonderful thing. And just in relation to the British colonialists, uh, I was reading through the, uh, the, the uh, secret now public documents of the British state in, relate to, in relation to Muck and Singh. So in one document they say, he says, they say, in, it can however be argued that in the, circumstance, in the circumstances of Kenya today, it is unlikely that a non-African, however fanatical, would emerge as a leader capable of stirring up the masses. They had real hopes, and they internalized their divide and rule projection and strategy. In another document, then secret, of the British, <laughs> then they say that although no, this is about a strike that Muck and Singh helped to lead, although no serious incidents or injuries occurred, the strike, which was remarkable for its intimidation, showed that Muck and Singh's influence and organizing ability were considerable. So here you have the British strategy wanting to weaken our forces, so division to assume, how can a Punjabi stir up the African masses in Nairobi, in Kenya? But in another document, they admit, they're having to admit, okay, <laughs> this guy was, had considerable influence and success. And when they talk about intimidation of a strike, you know that means the strike and the strikers were actually successful. We've heard it all before, time and time again, as we heard in the great miners' strike in 1984, 85 in this country. Thirdly, about imperialism, and as I hope I've articulated, imperialism hasn't gone away, you know. It's still very much here with us, and it's sowing havoc uh, all around the world, uh, particularly as we've seen still in the African continent. It was only a few years ago that the British and the French led the way for the destruction of a vanguard country of Africa, which was Libya. And it was in Libya, by the way, 
that I met, I met uh, in 2011 when NATO was bombing in Tripoli, that I met, I met a leader of the All African People's Revolutionary Party who took his namesake from Dylan Kimathi. And I interviewed him. Unfortunately, the comrade has now passed away. And that brings me also to the, to the last part about protecting our legacy, but just a little bit more about imperialism. Because the President of the United States, he's got uh, just a few more months left in office, Part of his heritage is of Kenya as well. He's, to quote a revolutionary, also a son of Africa. But perhaps because of the gilded cage he's in, perhaps that gilded cage informed his inaction of visiting his own family in, in, in East Africa, in Kenya, in his recent visit just a few weeks and months ago today. Actually, his paternal grandfather, if I'm not mistaken, was also tortured by the British and was, uh, worked with the Mau Mau as well in Kenya. But he did lecture the Kenyans and the Ethiopians uh, about whatever kind of neo-colonial things that, that, that he did. So imperialism is still, I mean, today with Eritrea in East Africa, Eritrea is the threat of a good example, uh, to, to quote the imperialists as well, and there's British and American sanctions against Eritrea, uh, Eritrea today as well. And the other speakers have touched upon it, but the complexities of the struggle in the neo-colonial period, in the post-independence period, is complex. There will be some differences here amongst us, but I think things like what's happened to Libya is an indication that the problem has not gone away and the challenges remain. And fourthly and finally, to about protecting our legacy today. I'm, 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 I'm a few years short of being 40 years old, and the more, I suppose, uh, indirectly I reflect on what my father has done and what Shiraz has done and others, I find myself in the direct company of people in their 70s and 80s. Because like the comrade I met in Tripoli in Libya, it's a race against time for people of my age and younger to capture these stories. Because it just so happened, coincidentally, I had my uh, MacBook with me in Tripoli. We were sitting in the hotel lobby and I said to the now deceased comrade, let's have an interview. And that interview now on YouTube, and now it's a permanent record of his story about the role of the African, Pan-African revolutionaries from North uh, America and their relationship to Libya and the African continent. So the, the, the challenge is this for, for, for our generation. Most importantly, to take the example of Mackensen and his comrades, to fight against cartism, to fight against communalism today. Um, also, I should mention as well, just in, in the fight against caste and communalism, the, frankly, the, the, the pathetic situation politically of our community today. But look at Makan Singh. They campaigned against ca a, a caste-centric organization of Gurdwaras in Kenya and in Nairobi. And look at the sorry state of our Gurdwaras and the way they're organized today. Isn't that a good example? Isn't that something we can look to? Yes, there's intimidation against those who want to push back against that, but we're not going to face 15 years imprisonment like, like, like our, our literal forefathers and foremothers did. But so our challenge is this, to unite our communities, to unite within our community, to unite our communities with the African communities and all people who are oppressed by the system of colonialism. And then also, very importantly, to try and literally recruit new cadres, new people who can work and protect and popularize the legacy of great revolutionaries like Makan Singh and others. And that's why I salute you, Shiraz Durrani, and the book, and all the people who have made Makan Singh alive today, his legacy alive, that can inform us and inspire us in the continuing challenges we face today. Thank you. Thank you, Sukant. A very, very passionate end to, this, to the um, presentations here. And I think starting from the first speaker to the last, you can see the legacy is very much alive. If this isn't even just about a disappeared history trying to recover it, it's a legacy and future generations are still going to be trying to continually discover and recover this history. So we have a few minutes now left for some questions. Um, and some discussion. So I'm, but I'm going to be passing around the mic. Raphael, if you can do that. 
please wait until the mic reaches you. So we've got one, one question here. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, um, all the speakers were very fascinating and there was so much to learn and take in. And, 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 and I, I want to say something that connects all the speakers to some extent, what everybody said. I uh, was reflecting on uh, Avinda's point about education. I was educated in Kenya as well. We talked about 1956 onwards. And it is true that, that the history we were taught was completely distorted about. We were never taught about um, and the African people's struggle, etc. But recently there have been changes because I, I was involved in organizing an exhibition by Mamao and I asked a friend of mine to bring me the textbooks from Kenya. So there is a textbook of uh, the evolving world and this is form three. It says a history of government course. The fascinating about this is there are sections about, it's quite internationalist in a sense, but there is a section about the trade union movement and Makan Singh gets three mentions in it. It's entirely cursory. He doesn't talk about his detention or anything like that. He talks about his part in the labor trade union of Kenya, etc., in 1935. He doesn't talk about the fact that he was a in 1950 onwards. He talks about African, uh, other African leaders like Kibacha, who was in fact exiled in Ken Kenya, but doesn't talk at all. So there is a kind of, and Malcolm Singh's photo doesn't appear. So I want to turn to Mary's point about very important contribution that Mary made about the kind of management of trade unions as a British state policy. Mm. I think it happened in Kenya. What happened in Kenya is that after Mackenzie was detained and that revolutionary trade union strand was destroyed, the emergency was declared in 1952. And as I understand it, in 1952, there was a trade union ordinance of registration of trade unions. Mm. At that time, a, a, a union called Kenya Federation of Registered Trade Unions was registered. In the end, that grew to become uh, the Kenya Federation of Labor. Yeah. And Tom Maboya became the general secretary. Yeah. He traveled UK. He went to Ruskin, by the way, I think. He traveled to the United States. And he, the, that particular one affiliated the International Conf Confederation of Free Trade Union Movements. So it ties up with your point mm -hmm. that the trade union movement was domesticated. We were in the Cold War as well. Yeah. So part of the Cold War politics came in. I want to turn to uh, Judith's point, just a brief comment on what you said. The, the strategy still happens today is that when you have political leaders, you either assassinate them or isolate them. And you can Mark and Singh was isolated for 11 years completely. And he, he emerges in independent Kenya. And, and by that time, you know, this Kenya Federation of Labor was established, the bureaucracy was there. They excluded him completely. This happens all the time. Isolation, exclusion, you know, by the movement. It's, it's a deliberate strategy. And, 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 uh, I think it's been put down. I, I, I know Shiraz quite well, and so, so I, um, I really want to congratulate him for what he's done. And he's got some very, very, um, very interesting other books that you want to read. But what, what, what Sukhan says is immensely important because one thing that, you know, this, this example says to us, I know you've seen, is that how we have to recover history, how we have to archive history, and how history is, ero you know, uh, eroded. You know, there's the erasure of history as well. And I was, talking about you saying there is a cycle. Sometimes in history gets buried completely, utterly and totally. It's never recovered because there are not people out there recovering, hard academia. And therefore, you know, I, I, I really think that very often the way, the way it's maintained is not through merely force. It's maintained to cons consent. The academia, the educational system, the media, the television, our libraries are all instruments in erasing history. We simply don't hear about it. I just want to stop there. Thank you very much. Thanks. No, you know, you were talking about um, uh, the local history not being taught in school. But I studied, I finished my O-levels in Tanzania. And when I was doing my O-levels, we were taught about East African history. So it is being mentioned, and all these names are coming up. So it's, uh, and that's how I know about Makan Singh, because we were taught in school. <laughs> and uh, your other point about unity, I really don't know how you're going to achieve it. I think you have to start at university level, here at the university. Get everybody together, let them change their attitude, because what's being taught at home is quite different. 
for each person. So I think you have to start changing their minds so that we learn to unite. Because it's very, very difficult. That's all. Report. I, I was a, a teacher in Tanzania for uh, five or six years and uh, also worked uh, um, in the mid-70s quite a bit in, in, uh, in Nairobi. Um, one, of the one of the questions here is that I would have liked to have heard something from Kenyans. I mean, all that new people. Uh, um, were the um, High Commission, Kenya High Commission, told about this meeting and asked whether they would like to attend and give their um, thoughts about this very important man. I, actually, at the beginning of this event, well, we had the room booked at six so we could set up the system, and it was packed. And Shiraz and I were both sitting here thinking, wow, we didn't expect that much of a turnout. And actually, there's another event taking place in the Brunei Gallery on democracy in Africa. Um, with, let's just say, a very different kind of social mix. And it actually is very revealing of the times. So there are students there attending that, and we're over here. And it would, would it, we, we publicize events as far as we can. But actually, it would be, and, that, and maybe that's the next step. And I think you know, one event can achieve one thing by bringing Mackenzie onto this platform. But actually, the next step is actually using these platforms to build bridges across communities. Because actually so much d damage has been done to that kind of unity. Um, you look at, even in a place like SOAS, which is seen as one of, you know, it's been branded as one of these hotbeds, you know, for want of a better word, radicalization. The, the, the biggest threat is actually the student body coming together and not being in an Islamic society or Indian society or Hindu society. <laughs> you know, it's actually reversing that trend. Um, and I think a lot of that work can be done in universities. But a lot of that work needs to be done out there in communities as well. So this politicization that has to take place, it's curriculum, it's you know, addressing the dominant discourse that's out there. You know, the ways in which Kenya is known, even by you know, those of us who are you know, next generation, who consider ourselves having some East African kind of heritage, you know, we won't understand this history until, unless we attend something like this. So it, this, this is a long process. So this is a great project for any students that are out there would like to be part of this recovery mm -hmm. and building this. I think that's, that's really important. And reaching out, and I think that's an important point, you know, with people who are descendants of, you know, Kenya or, you know, Kenyan activists or working on the ground in Kenya. So, yeah, it's a shame, really. But. Could I just like to make a, just a concrete proposal that I'm, I'm sure, you know, between us and perhaps other students in the room that we can organize a, a, another book launch event mm -hmm about this and we invite actually our, um, our African heritage, Pan-African comrades to speak as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, between us, we you know, you know quite mm -hmm. a lot of people. But I know people like George Shire, who's a decolonial Zimbabwean scholar in London. Mm -hmm. I know Brother Omawale from the Pan-African Society. And there's, there's many other people, uh, also East African, Pan-Africanists who can come and speak. And then hopefully with, with, with activists from SOAS mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. um, you're absolutely right. You know, if we had a meeting about some petty microaggression, quote unquote, that we suffer today. We probably have the whole lecture theater stuffed full. <laughs> but when it's talking about the macroaggressions of colonialism and liberation, somehow people, some, for some reason, people switch off. But yeah, that's yeah. the challenge we have to reverse. Or, or if you want a, yet another statue of some other figure in the Indian nationalist movement, who was, ve you know, it's being now revealed, which most of us knew had very you know, racist attitudes towards Africans in South Africa, Gandhi. There are now two statues. Um, and we need those revelations now tell us. We've got a figure like Mukhan Singh, who allows us to think outside of nationalism. You know, he was an internationalist and before, his, before they even the notion of internationalism really existed in that way. You know, he was operating on that level. And I think these are things that we need to be thinking and talking about rather than just following that. So, yeah, proposal accepted. Let's think, we'll think of ways in which 
which we can do that and we can find ways of communicating um, about continuing on the conversation and widening it out as well. Just a casual comment to all of you. Um, I'm from the United States originally. My parents emigrated from India to the U.S. directly there. So I just want to say how refreshing an event like this was for someone like me to really get recognition and understanding of the heroes of our diaspora. Um, you know, the, the stories can be different, but in the end they are all rooted in the same struggle. And it is, I, I coming from academia in the United States, the South Asia programs are far different than this and much more flowery to say the least. So. Uh, thank you all for, you know, just having this, hosting this for whatever it is. I, I'm glad to be here and learn about heroes like this. So, thank you. And just one thing I forgot to mention that was an apology for, from Makin Singh's daughter who was going to be here but for personal circumstances couldn't be here, Inderjeet Gill. So at the next event, hopefully we can have her there. And if from in Charles's um, book here, you can read. Um, it was very interesting. I mean, I've read it through and then gone back to bits, um, learning about what it was like to be the child of someone in exile, you know, and getting that kind of glimpse. Um, and having a father who's an activist who yet you don't get to see very often, and then kind of living through the legacy through other people's stories. So maybe next time we can. I think with one last, one last point then. I, 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 I have a very simple proposal. When you Google Makan Singh, you get Wikipedia. When you open the page up, information is rubbish yeah, you know yes. so somebody here should look take Shiraz's book take the page and edit that page so every time somebody googles Marcus Singh mm -hmm. they get the right information <laughs> <laughs> thank you simple proposal Okay. Well, thank you all for coming, and I'd like to thank all of our speakers for, you know, very enlightening. And each of you had something unique. You gave a very, each of you had a kind of different insight, but in incredibly valuable, you know, across the spectrum of being family members, political activists, people who are working in Kenya, reflecting on, you know, the, the, the Labour Party here, do we join or don't we, Mary? That's the question. Um, <laughs> you know, knowing that history, the TUC and the Labour you Party. Them, you, and, <laughs> you know, and diaspora. So I, I've, re I've really enjoyed, you know, and hosting this. It's been a real pleasure. So thank you all. Thank, thank you. you.